Hey everyone, Dr. Jack Horty, and in the previous few videos I've been covering Alzheimer's disease, some of the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. Now I'm going to discuss one of the tools of Alzheimer's disease, and that is animal models of Alzheimer's disease. Now there are actually a range of animal models across from fish to sheep. Um, there are models of Alzheimer's disease, but in this one I'm just going to be covering the rodent models because they are by far the most popular models used for Alzheimer's disease research. So we're going to be looking at the mouse and the rat. Now, just a little refresher, there are mutations in the human genome that can guarantee you to get Alzheimer's disease. These are called familial Alzheimer's disease mutations, and most of them lie in the amyloid precursor protein, and they promote the production of the AB to 42 product, uh, product or cleavage product of the APP, the amyloid precursor protein. So here's a range of mutations over here um, that can lead to gamma secretase cleavage to generate the AB to 42 fragment. And here's a mutation over here that increases the beta secretase cleavage to promote the amyloid beta 42 fragment production. Now, there are also mutations in the gamma secretase, which is the enzyme that cleaves the amyloid precursor protein, and they promote the AB to 42 uh, cleavage site, these mutations, and they can cause the increase in amyloid beta 42 production in the brain. So what we want to do, obviously, to get a good animal model, you can see that these familial Alzheimer's genes are going to be an excellent opportunity to create an Alzheimer's mouse model. So for it, we take uh, a, a single embryo, uh, a single-celled embryo, so it's sort of just a fertilized egg right there, a zygote, if you will, and we need to insert the DNA that we want. We need to put in a piece of DNA that contains that familial Alzheimer's disease mutation. Then when the mouse grows up, typically they'll be heterozygous for that gene, and sometimes we want to make them homozygous, and we do that through breeding. Um, uh, and we have various reporters and checks to make sure that the gene that we tried to insert has been inserted. Now, we used to use um, old technology, technology like Talon, to do this, but if we were to do this right now in some of the newer models coming out, we would definitely use CRISPR gene editing technology, which is a very powerful technique that maybe I'll do a video on later because I haven't yet covered CRISPR, but it's an amazing genetic engineering technology. So to understand what they're inserting into the mouse genome, we first need to have a little talk about promoters. Now, promoters are a little piece of DNA um, that's upstream from a gene that regulate the function of the gene. And so here we have a little setup. Now, um, what promoters are doing, they do lots of things, but what they are doing is, what you have to imagine is that your skin cells and your neurons contain the same DNA. They contain the same set of instructions. So how could they possibly turn into different cells? Well, one piece of this puzzle is promoters. There is other pieces like epigenetics, blah, blah, blah. But one big piece of the puzzle is promoters. So promoters are a small segment of DNA upstream from the gene, and they mount a promoter protein. Okay, so this might be how it works. Here we have a piece of DNA down the bottom. We've got a neuronal gene here and a neuronal promoter. And we've got a skin gene here and a skin promoter. And then a neuronal promoter region and a neuronal gene and a skin promoter region and a, a skin gene and so on and so forth. Now, because this cell is in the skin, it will be getting signals from the extracellular environment to certain receptors that it is in the skin location of the body. Now, these will activate certain skin signaling receptors that will then activate certain skin promoters. These are um, proteins that will bind to the skin promoter regions on the DNA. So these skin promoters then mount the RNA polymerase and then... Oh, James Cameron, eat your heart out. Look at that animation technique right there. So they will then promote the production of skin gene RNA, which will then turn into skin proteins. And so then you end up with skin proteins regulating the function of your skin cells. So you might have keratin, which is a protein important for your skin, being produced through this promoter region uh, mechanism. Now, if you're a neuron, you're going to have neuron signaling molecules binding to neuronal promoter regions and causing the production of neuronal RNA and neuronal proteins, like synapse proteins. There's no point in a skin cell producing a synapse protein, so it needs to be on a different promoter. So the important thing there is when editing the genome of the mouse, we can dictate where the gene is going to be expressed based on what promoter region we put in front of our gene.
So when we are inserting these familial Alzheimer's genes into the mice, we need to put a mouse neuronal promoter at the front of that gene. Now that's very important because the gene we're inserting is human. It's a human APP gene, a human amyloid precursor protein gene. So we need to put a mouse neuronal promoter at the front of that that will mount a, a promoter region that will mount a neuronal promoter and cause the expression of this gene only in the brain. We don't want the amyloid, mutated amyloid being expressed in the liver or in the bone marrow or the kidney. What we want to do is express it in the brain. So that's an important thing. When we insert a gene into a mouse, we need to insert the appropriate promoter so our gene will be expressed in the correct organ. So in this case, we have a mouse neuronal promoter and a familial Alzheimer's disease gene. Now, one of the most common Alzheimer's mouse models um, is called the APP PS1 gene insertion. Now, for that, they use a mouse neuronal promoter, and they put, actually insert two different genes. One is for a familial Alzheimer's disease. Uh, disease gene in the APP protein. This is called the Swedish mutation and it promotes beta secretase activity. So this will cause the APP uh, protein to be cleaved um, excessively by the beta secretase um, enzyme. The other gene that we put in is we actually put in a mutated um, gamma secretase that promotes the cleavage at the other end, at the AT site on the APP promoter to promote that 42 production. So we're putting in two genes on a mouse neuronal promoter, one in the APP gene, one in the gamma secretase to really guarantee that this mouse will get familial Alzheimer's disease. And so that's the APP PS1. And now, there, uh, when it comes to promoters, there are actually different strengths of promoters. You can imagine that some neuronal genes need to be expressed a lot. Maybe a synapse gene needs to be expressed a lot. And some neuronal genes maybe don't need to be expressed as much. I don't know, but maybe a lower important protein that's in lower abundance. Um, so when we're choosing our promoter, we can actually choose a strong promoter or a weak promoter. Um, actually, one of the strongest promoters you can use is a viral promoter, but that will be expressed everywhere and loads of it because we stole the promoter region um, from a virus. Um, but uh, what we do in the Alzheimer's model is we normally put a strong neuronal promoter in. And an important thing is we're actually inserting a gene. So that means that the mouse still has their own APP and gamma secretase. So what that means is we've kind of doubled the amount of APP and gamma secretase that they've got there. Um, and because we put it on a strong promoter, we've probably more than doubled because we've put it on a really strong promoter to get a lot of protein expression. So we're going to end up with overexpression. We've got the mouse APP, we've got the human APP, we've got it on a, a strong promoter region, we've got all that kind of stuff. So we're going to end up with a lot. So here is a picture of an Alzheimer's brain 12 months um, into development. So they're 12 months old, relatively old for a mouse. Not super old, but relatively old. And we can see that their brain is absolutely packed to the top with plaques. Now this is would be very, very, very late stage Alzheimer's disease. I don't know if we've even seen this amount of plaques in a human. This is a tremendous amount of plaques. I've seen worse in animal mouse models. In a rat model, holy moly, I've seen a lot worse. But that is a lot of plaque. And that's because it's a very aggressive model. It's overexpression. Um, so we can actually see cognitive deficits at like, mm, depending on your test, six to nine months with these mice. Which is a lot when you consider to that 18 months, you know, uh, two years is a very old mouse. So it's kind of, you know, maybe a third of the way through their life we can start to pick up cognitive deficits. And if you put that onto the human time span, which isn't a great thing to do, you can see that it's a very aggressive model. Now, what's less aggressive is we can do a knock-in. Now, a knock-in model is when we... Um, so here we have the actual mouse APP gene. So this is the mouse amyloid precursor protein gene. It's on its normal promoter. This is the normal APP promoter that it would have from motor region. And what we do is we knock out the gene and we put in the human uh, mutated gene. But we keep the actual regular mouse promoter region there intact. So it's a knock in. We're knocking out the mouse gene and we're knocking in the human edited gene. So um, what we can do, and one of the most common and really great models of this, it's called the APP NF dash F knock in insertion. I know that's a mouthful um, model, but basically it describes what mutations have been incorporated. And it's an APP gene that actually contains two familial 
mutations that occur in APP. Uh, this NL substitution here that promotes beta uh, secretase cleavage, that's called the Swedish mutation. Um, it's a very powerful mutation. It's one of the first familial Alzheimer's disease mutations we've discovered. And uh, another mutation over here at the other end of the uh, amyloid fragment that promotes gamma secretase. So you can see why... Um, uh, uh, you can see where its name comes from here based on the mutations that have been caused in here. So this is the uh, name of the mouse uh, and um, it, there's some serious advantages to this model. It has a natural APP promoter so it's not over expressing it, it's expressing it where and at the levels you would expect. So there's no overexpression, and there's expression in the right locations. If you put an artificial neuronal promoter in there that's not normally associated with the APP protein, it's going to be expressed in different locations. And you kind of notice this with the mouse. You, you get a lot of cortical plaques before you get hippocampal plaques, depending on the model. And that's not really what happens in the human. Um, and here is a 12-month image of the plaques in this mouse model. So in bright orange, we've got a picture of where the plaques are in this mouse model at the same age. You can see it's much less aggressive and perhaps more realistic to the human. It allows the aging component of the mouse to interact with the plaques rather than inducing strong plaques in young mice. We're now getting an old mice. We can leave these mice to get much older and see the interaction between aging and the plaques, which is what we would see in the human condition. So if I just put those side by side, those are the same aged mouse, just two different mouse models. One's an insertion and one's a knock-in. Lots of advantages to the knock-in. Now they have made rat models as well, um, and rat models have some distinct advantages. So they've made an APP PS1 mouse, which is the first insertion that I talked about. They've also made an APP PS1 rat, which is an insertion, same as the mouse. Um, so what do we get in the mouse? We do get cognitive decline, we do get amyloid plaques, we do get inflammation, we do get phosphorylated tau, and that is actually that phosphorylated tau is actually essential to neuronal decline. But we don't get neuronal tangles or neuronal death. There's no um, tangling of the tau. Obviously, it doesn't get up to a level enough that can cause tangling, and we don't get any neuronal death. In rats, we get cognitive decline, amyloid plaques, inflammation, phosphorylated tau, and we get neurofibrillary tangles, and we get neuronal death. We get atrophy of the neurons, atrophy of the brain, which is not what we get in the mouth. Now, why do we get this? Given that I've got the same insertions, the same thing happened with the knock-in situation. Rats seem to have a different pathology to the mouse. Well, the answer might be time. The rats are living longer. Often we evaluate these rats at 26 months, for example, and you would never even get an Alzheimer's mouse that's 26 months old. So perhaps the amyloid to inflammation to tau pathology to neuronal fibrillary tangles actually takes a certain amount of time. And if you don't have that time, you can't get that neuronal neuronal death going on. So perhaps that's why rats are actually a better model. Rats are more expensive, they're bigger, they take longer. Again, most PhDs are only three years or four years. So how are you going to do a model where it takes two and a half years to get the rats into the cognitively declined severe Alzheimer's disease zone? So they're a slow model, it's easier to genetically engineer a mouse. So there's a lot of pros and cons to these models. So how do we know that there's cognitive decline? I just want to take you through a couple of behavioral tasks here. Here we have the Morris water maze. Um, and this is a task where basically we train a mouse or a rat to find a hidden platform. Now, it's, I've got an arrow there saying a platform they can't see. And that's because it's below the surface of the water. We also put a white paint in the water to help prevent the mouse from, or rat looking through the paint and in, down into the platform. Now, um, the, the mouse or rat will just swim around and around and around. They don't like being in that water, really. So they want to get out. So they're going to hunt for it. So here we can see this rat is just hunting for it. <laughs> this is definitely a rat. They sometimes like to just float. And here we go. The rat has found the platform. Now, we important thing to know is we don't let the mice or rat swim for too long. For mice, it's typically a minute. And for rats, maybe 90 seconds. Now, mice and rats can actually swim for hours, but we just put them in there because we don't want to stress them out. And we actually warm the water because we don't want them to get cold. So we want to try and make it a very nice experience for the animals and not too long. Now, what we do is we keep doing that. So we do that over days. Um, here we can see this is probably rats, and you can see that that max time, they haven't gone above 80 or 90 seconds there. 
So on day one, they do very poorly. That you, you actually do four trials in a day. You try to space them out to let them dry up and warm up. And you do four trials in a day normally. And then you do it over several days, four to five days. And you can see here the rodent is learning where their platform is. So this is time it takes for them to get to the platform over days. And you can see that the rodents get really, really good at finding the platform. And actually, they just stop on the platform and then they look at where you're going to come from you've got to be hidden because mice and rats will swim towards you if you've gentled them like you've got to play with your rodents to de-stress them get them to trust you you start to trust them you really like your rodents that you're normally doing an experiment on and so <laughs> normally by the end of the experiment they'll get on the platform and they'll look to the doorway that you're going to come from and then you come in and normally and this is my mice because i like to really get to know my mice because i don't want stress to be a component i want it all to be about memory and not about stress my mice are so chill that I can just lower my hand down and they'll just hop onto my hand. And then I pick them up, I give them a little pat, I wrap them in a towel, and then I put them in a little warm chamber to warm up for maybe an hour before the next time they go uh, into the bath. And I do that four times a day and they get way, way better. And then on the fifth day, on the sixth day, we do what's called a probe trial. We remove the platform and then we track where the rodent swims. So here the rodent started down here and it swam, 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 swam. And you can see it's swimming around that platform a lot. This is a top view of the maze and we're just tracking the mouse using tracking software or rats. We can see this rat spending a huge amount of time near that platform, so it has remembered where the platform is, right? So we have confirmed that this rodent has a great memory because it's remembered where that platform is and it's swimming around and around and around. Now there's a wild type mouse, aka a normal mouse. Now here we have the APP PS1 mice. You can see it hasn't learned anything over the last five days. It is just swimming around and around in circles looking for a platform. It has no specific memory about the location of that platform, so it's forgotten. So here we have good evidence that there is memory decline in these animals. Now, I actually prefer to do a different test. It's called the novel object test. There's also a novel smell test. I, I think the novel smell test is really, really good as well. Um, and it relies on the natural exploratory behavior of the mice and what they like to do. Mice and rats like to do this. So it doesn't have that stress component of the water, which I, is why I prefer this model over the water model. So in this model, we put the mice in an arena with objects. Now on day one, we put them in the arena with two identical objects. Um, this is actually all done on the same day normally. So I put them in the, there with two identical objects, or if I'm doing novel smell, two identical smells, two vanillas, for example. Then I do that for eight minutes, then I take them out, I clean the cage, I clean the mouse, um, I, I reset, and then I put in... Uh, an object that they've already seen before and a new object and this one might be a blue object and it's all going to be different shapes because mice have very different sites so you're going to rely on shapes textures sizes stark contrast things like black and white stripes versus block colors because mice have really poor eyesight so i put in a new object that would actually be much more different than the one i'm displaying right there and then the mouse because they're curious animals mice and rats will spend more time near the new object they've seen the brown one so they don't want to spend any time with that so they're going to spend time with this new funky blue object right but here's the catch an alzheimer's mice has forgotten the brown object so the next time you show it it's like oh two new objects let's explore them equally so what you do is you time how long the mouse or rat is spending around each object and based on that you can tell whether it remembered being around the other object um, the brown object in this case so this is called novel object or novel smell so you might go from vanilla to vanilla and strawberry and see if they spend more time around the strawberry because they've already smelled the vanilla and mice are naturally, and rats are naturally smelling animals. So I actually think that's probably a better test. I like the normal smell test. Um, and there's no stress component here. They're actually enjoying themselves and exploring new objects for fun. So I kind of prefer this one a little bit. Um, and to do a lot of this, we use tracking software, although sometimes we just use a blinded observer because whether a mouse is looking at an object or looking above the object, it's hard to tell from a top-down camera like this image right here. Awesome, but certainly for the Morris Water Maze, we use tracking software that can track the head and the body of the animal, just like that. Awesome, thank you very much. So that's animal models of Alzheimer's disease. If you have any questions, uh, flick me a message either down there or you know via email, however you want, and I'm always keen to chat about research.